most of you know Vusi as um, uh, the CEO of My Growth Fund and as a public speaker. He's a venture capitalist. I don't know if you know that he's also a best-selling author. Um, My Growth Fund is a venture capital firm that facilitates access to development finance, access to market, and invests in developing business owners. For that, they look into your business model. So we, I'm going to hand over to you, Vusi. Um, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us. And somebody's saying, Vusi the dragon. <laughs> Sam, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, to everybody that's joining us, Thank you for, for this session. So I, I think first just to kind of take a step back in terms of what it is that's going to be in our conversation today. And what I am hoping we can do is to have a discussion uh, rather than a presentation. So I'll present with you what I think are a series of thoughts for you to consider. And then I'm very happy for us to get into a, a Q&A. My own experience with these things is that there tends to be a lot more value um, when we are exchanging ideas, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is ask each of you in the comments section, go and register for me what is the foremost question in your mind right now about your business. So go into the chat section right now and write down for yourself, what is the most important question that you're asking yourself about your business right now? Let's take a solid 30 seconds so that everybody has some time to do that. By the way, you know, the English doesn't have to be very academic. So don't, you don't have to feel pressure to write Vusa Tembubai English. Just write down what, what your foremost questions are. Um, and, and, uh, and the rest will take care of itself. The rest will take care of itself. So let's do that for the next 30 seconds. Um, and whilst you do that for the next 30 seconds, I'm going to uh, go through some of the questions and see that um, we're aligned in terms of what it is I wanted to share. Where will my business be in five years from now? Jesus, Albert. <laughs> That's a tough question. And, and by the way, I've got to tell you that I think it's a question that most business people actually shouldn't be asking. You shouldn't be asking a question like that, but I'll share with you my thoughts about why in a minute. I'm running a water purification company, so I would like to know if I should put my business, uh, let's see, put my business on an online selling since I deliver my bottles to the customers. That's an interesting question, evidence. We'll see if we have some time to get into that. Evidence, that's a hell of a name. You need a lot of evidence for me to answer that question. That was a joke, evidence. Um, on average, how long should my business start trading from the moment of what I am going to be selling to the moment I start selling to my first customer? I imagine you say from the moment I know what I'm going to be selling. Okay, um, got it. I'm. Uh, how will my product resonate with the market? Is there any more room for athletic wear? Um, how to grow and attract customers? Very fairly generic question, Nomsa, but I'll try and help you with that. How do I continue to remain relevant in an ever-changing industry? That is, that is the question of our time, isn't it? It's all of our markets, all of our industries that we're all operating in and working in today are shifting and changing. And the question for us as entrepreneurs and business builders is how do we remain relevant? So I'm going to get started, guys. And the way I'd like to do this is if you have a pen and paper, please um, have it in front of you. Because what I'm going to, to do is to share with you uh, a lot of a lot of that. How? Let me just very. I've been in. I've been a professional speaker for 16 years. I've had the privilege of working in 49 countries. I've probably addressed over three, four million people over that time. Uh, in an average year, I will travel between 19 and 22 countries at a point in time. So that's two to three countries in a month. That's in an average year. I, I say this to make this point. Um, when it comes to these kinds of conversations, there are very few things I have not heard um, or I have not seen. Very few. So for me, um, one of the things I've realized is that knowledge is ubiquitously available. You can find knowledge and information about anything you want to do at any time, actually. It's, it's all around us. But knowledge alone doesn't 
create an impetus for change. So to say, th say differently, knowing what to do and doing what you know to do are different things. And I've seen over the past uh, 16 years as a professional speaker, 10 years in capital markets, uh, eight years as a venture capitalist, one of the things I've realized is that people know what to do. It's not that you don't know, guys. It, there's something underlying um, us that often is the impediment between what we know and what we do. I say this to make this point. I am a how person. I'm not a what person. There are a lot of what people out there. They'll tell you what to do. I'm not as interested in what to do. I'm more interested in how to do it. Because I think once you understand the mechanistic way of doing things, the process of doing things, then doing the thing is, is a lot easier, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's a lot more tenable, a lot more manageable, and, and, and frankly, um, a lot easier for you to do. So, so for me, that's what's important. That how is very, very important. And, and I'm going to ask that you, in your mind, make a mental note of that, right? So, so how um, are you going to do what you are asking of yourself to actually do? How? That how is like everything. If you can't get the how right, nothing else matters. Mechanistic process about how to do. Later, we talk about the what, but the how to do is very, very important. So make a note for that, about that in your own mind. Right. So the first thing, I think the first place to start is maybe just to take a step back and understand the context in which we find ourselves and where we are operating and what's happening around us. So my study, um, my training, I trained as a finance person, so I I like the world of Excel spreadsheets and balance sheets. I, I understand those well. Um, my background is in sales, so you train in finance, but you're studying complex financial products. Um, and my fascination is with economics. That should kind of give you a sense of how my brain works, right? So I like I like arithmetic. I like I like the rudimentary study of of numbers and the flow of information. I like logical process flows, and, and I like to look at the big picture so I can understand how my actions are going to influence that big picture. So let's start first with the big picture. Here's the big picture. If you're operating in South Africa, which I imagine most of us in this conversation are, if you're operating in South Africa today, here are the facts. There are 55 million South Africans. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which is the deepest capital markets in the continent, with the most complex set of products. What that means is it's got the widest um, uh, product variation of any stock exchange in the continent. That will change over the next five years if the people in Morocco continue their trajectory for growth as they are. Um, but the Johannesburg Stock Exchange continues to occupy position number one in terms of stock exchanges and capital markets in the continent. And the reason that's important is because the interface between the public flow of funds and private enterprise, these things we call businesses, is the stock exchange, right? So generally where uh, pension funds will buy shares in a business or will participate in a debt instrument of a particular business is they'll go to the stock exchange to do that. Generally, not always. But if you look at the JSE, <laughs> Many years ago, the JSE had a, um, and they still do actually, they have an exchange called Altex. And many years ago, I was a, I was a majority shareholder in an Altex listed business. Um, but the JSE has, I, in fact, I was a majority shareholder of a structure that was a majority shareholder in an Altex listed business. So I understand very well how Altex listings work. They are, as they say, underregulated, but over-supervised. And the impetus for the Altex, guys, was to prepare small businesses and growth businesses for the main board. That was the whole impetus. It was like a, 
It was like a graduation platform. You listed your business on Altex to ready yourself for the main board. If you go and look today, and you compare the number of, the, of businesses listed on the Altex today versus five years, you'll see a marked decline in, in the number of businesses there. But not only that, if you look at the main board, you'll see a marked business, a marked decline in the number of businesses that are, that are listed in the main board over the past decade. I'm saying this to make this very simple point that there are fewer businesses dominating the economy of our country. That's a terrible thing, by the way, because one of the things you learn about how high growth economies are built that promise high uh, operating leverage for new entrants is you need mass participation of, and mass participation and a high growth of new upstarts. The reason it's the case that you've seen a marked decline in Altex listed businesses is not only because the cost of listing is expensive. And I promise you guys, I need you to understand the high level. I know some of you are listening going, what are we talking about? Just trust me, this is gonna make sense. It's not only because the cost of listing is expensive, but it's also because the environment we are operating in is not conducive for building high growth businesses. That's a big part of why we are where we are. And you can't deal with the one without dealing with the other, right? So there's a lot of work for us to do there. If we want to be deliberate about how we exercise ourselves as um, agents of change using this thing called a business. I want you to, on your notepad, ask yourself this question and just write it down. You don't have to answer it to the rest of us in this conversation but I just want you to write this question down. And I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds to give some thought to this question. And here's the question, why are you in business? Just write that question down. Why am I in business? I think a lot of us are in business, if I can be honest in this conversation, because of the romantic concept of business. Eh? That business is very romantic, you know? Uh, one of the things I often hear is when people say, I wanna work for myself. I don't know how to tell you this, but the minute you start a business, you work for many people. Yourself is the last person you work for. First, you work for your customers. I beg your pardon, I was saying first you work for your customers, then you work for your suppliers, then you work for your staff, then you work for your shareholders, and then eventually for you. So the idea that you're in business and therefore you work for yourself, if that's how you're thinking, you need a fundamental rethink. That's, you work for many people, Yourself is the last person in the run of, of the, the, the group of people that you work for. So let's just take a step back and talk about a bit about what I've done. I told you a little bit about this challenge we have of our capital market system not being welcoming to, to small, uh, medium, and high growth businesses. This is an important conversation to have because I was on a call with, the, um, with a company that facilitates listings uh, for stock exchanges in Europe, particularly in, in the United Kingdom. And one of the things that came out of that conversation actually was how much appetite there is in those markets for small businesses to list. It's unbelievable. I could not believe how much appetite there is for you and me to list our businesses in those markets, huge appetite. But if there's all this appetite and it's for African businesses to list there, then why aren't African businesses taking that opportunity up? What's missing? What's the, what's, the, what's the missing formula? What's the trick that we're missing to enable us to actually take advantage of that, right? And that's a, a big question for us to answer and I hope to answer it um, over the course of our conversation. And then just a final note on this conversation about capital markets. If you are an entrepreneur, and I know most of us in this conversation are, we often talk about access to funding. When I say at capital markets, it's a corporate finance term for access to funding. Capital markets are markets where you go to access capital. That's all they are, right? It's a very you know like smooth way that corporate financiers uh, you say you know this is this is the ability for the average person to access capital in the market. We know that that that's an important measure because absent of it, 
it's very difficult for business people to build businesses. I want to remind you in this conversation that for the first 13 years of its history, 13 years of its history, Amazon ran operating losses. Losses. Now, in South Africa, the uh, Companies Act says that if a company runs losses for three years or more, then the directors of that company, then the auditors of that company have to, by law, they have to um, issue a disclaimer in your audited financial statements. They have to, right? So, so, so a Jeff Bezos can never happen in South Africa. It's impossible because he wouldn't be allowed to run his business the way he runs Amazon. For the first seven years of its, of its existence, Facebook didn't even have a revenue model. Seven years it existed, it didn't make a cent. Guys, I run a venture capital firm. Just this year, we won the best impact investment firm for Africa at the uh, Worldwide Finance Awards. I can tell you for free, I have never seen an African business running for seven years without a revenue model. Never seen it. So we, we like to pretend like we do venture funding, but we don't. We use venture funding fundamentals to actually do business access to business finance. That's what we do. And it's a hugely critical statement. And there are uh, people who work in the industry with me who would be very upset to hear me say that. But it's a statement of fact. It's just a statement of fact. So what I want to do is to uh, bet us on a couple of thoughts, and I prepared this for you guys. Uh, it'll help you understand kind of where my thinking is coming from. Right. So let's, let's take a step back here. So this is the first thing I want to show you. Have a look at this. Remember I told you guys I'm an economics finance guy? All right, so this is my economics finance brain working. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have to tell you, um, <laughs> One of, the, one, of the, one of the great privileges of running a firm like ours is that I am now accountable to people other than myself. You know, so for instance, for all the investments that we make, I have an investment committee and my investment committee has like some really, really sharp people. And in the firm, I have a board and my board has some really, really sharp people. You know, so, so I'd like to sit here and pretend like, you know, I am this amazing superstar who does all of this by himself. It's just not true, guys. It's not true. I have people around me who, whose job it is is to make sure that I succeed. But I also have to tell you that it's designed that way, deliberately. I designed it that way. When I realized the rate at which our business was growing and where we were going, I, need, I realized I needed to put people around me who could protect me from myself, but also who could help me unlock opportunities. And, and, you know, my, my board and I have very frank conversations, a lot of them about the firm, about the strategy, about my management team, about me, deep conversations about me. And so one of the questions for you to ask yourself to all of the 80 participants in this conversation is, do you have a board, right? Um, and I'm not talking about a fiduciary board, even if it's a, an advisory board, but do you have a board? People that you go to who give you, you know, unsolicited free advice, but you know that it's advice that's dependable, that you can act on. Now, back to this graph that I'm showing you. This graph is the, uh, it demonstrates or looks at the growth of the world's economy since the death of Jesus. It's economics work done by a fellow called Angus Madison, who in my opinion is probably one of the foremost thinkers and economists of our time. Angus Madison, uh, looked at and framed the world's economy since the death of Jesus. He worked with, I think it was 48 other professors in total. And what they proved was that the growth of the world's economy, a measure that we use in economics called GDP, has been exponential. You see it in the dark blue line from the first to the 20th century. And you see those notated um, on, on, I think it's the, it's the y-axis, on the y-axis. So, so on the y-axis, you see the first to the, to the 20th century, the dark blue line shows you economic output. And what you notice is that there is a huge rise in global economic output, GDP, in the 20th century. 
The question could be why. The answer is very simple. The world is connected today. Human beings are connected to one another. We're, we're connected. We're chatting. We're talking. You know, today, you can buy a product in one part of the world, ship it to another part of the world using a shipment company in a different part of the world and sell it to a consumer in an even different part of the world. Right? So, so, so the world's economy has grown fundamentally. That's this here, this dark blue line. The light blue line demonstrates life expectancy. And what do you notice? That's also increasing. So the point about that is simply to recognize that human beings today are living longer than they've lived ever. Certainly over the past 2000 years of us keeping a record of global life expectancy, right? Um, in simple English, there's never been a better time to be a human being on this little rock of ours called Earth than today. But I have a question for all of us in this conversation, and my question is this. If my hypothesis is true, and I'm arguing here that it is, then explain to me why perhaps global income inequality is higher today than it's been in a very long time. The reason for that is because whilst there is a growth in wealth, the instruments of distributing that wealth are not efficient. So wealth redistribution is an important part of how you sustain a society, right? And if we don't get the wealth distribution mechanisms right, you can't sustain the underlying society. This tags back to my very first argument that I was making earlier when I spoke about the role of the JSE, the role of capital markets. Because the Public Investment Corporation, the PIC, the ESCOM Pension Fund, um, the Transnet Pension Fund, um, all of the large pension funds in South Africa have trillions of rands that they invest in businesses. The majority of that money goes into the traditional JSE, which are large listed businesses. So there's something here for me that doesn't make sense. Pension funds are taking the funds of pensioners who work in actual companies that are in the real economy doing real work every day but they're buying shares on a financial economy on the secondary market that is the stock exchange. So the money of pensioners then, who are earning that money in the real economy doesn't go back towards re financing real economic growth. I wonder if you guys understand the point I'm making. The money that yours and my parents are making or you know, saved up in their pensions, Yours and my parents worked in a real company in a real factory. They earned a real wage. But the money that they earn that's sitting in their pension fund, which is money that's intended to go to industrialization of the economy, actually markets, buys shares of a listed company, and it doesn't reindustrialize the economy, doesn't build new economic capacity, doesn't finance new businesses. And then we wonder why entrepreneurs are saying that there's no money for funding. And uh, the JSE is seeing a, a loss a net loss in the number of new listings. It's just because the capital flows are going to the wrong place. And time allowing a bit later, we can discuss some of the changes that we're expecting in terms of Regulation 28. I wanna pause on this for a while. This is a very, very busy graph. This, is, this was actually published on the um, front page of um, Wall Street, no, no, it wasn't the Wall Street Journal, of the Washington Post literally just immediately after Jeff Bezos bought it. It was an article about access to, call it electricity, in the African continent. And I just want to pause here for a minute, guys. The dark blue represents the percentage of the population in each country that does not have access to electricity. And just so we're clear, and I qualify it, that does not have access to consistent electric electricity supply. Dark blue. So if you look, something should jump out at you, which is look at North Africa. Look at Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt. You notice the, Moroc the North Africans have their act together. Uh, this is why when people talk about Africa, I often ask them, which Africa are you talking about? because there are three different Africas. There's North Africa, which, which is in whose culture and in whose construct is actually closer to the Middle East than it is to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
There's Central Africa, which tends to be dominated by huge mineral industrial complexes, massive oil deposits, but also wars. And then there's the SADC region, which is in the lower um, um, African portion. That tends to be dominated by the South African hegemon, you know, deepest capital market system, most advanced infrastructure, most advanced banking system in the continent, yada, yada, fish pace. So when you talk about Africa, the question you must ask yourself is, which of these three are we actually talking about? Now, I want you to ask yourself the question, look at these dark blues, right? So Nigeria is the, is the largest economy in Africa, but 55% of the population of Nigeria doesn't have access to consistent electricity supply. What do you think would happen if that number was half? What would be the size of the Nigerian economy? So in my mind today, if you are in an African business and you don't have a Nigerian strategy, you don't have an African strategy. You can't be in Africa and not be in Nigeria. You just can't. Um, look, at, look at East Africa. Look at Uganda, Rwanda, Tanzania, Somalia, Kenya, and Ethiopia, right? This, just those economies alone. Uh, by the way, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania are often called the Eastern Corridor. Um, they're busy building a transfrontier railway that will run through those economies. But if you looked at just those economies alone, it's over 50% for all of those economies. In fact, it's over 70%, right? With Ethiopia, at 76% being the best one. So what do you think happens if you re reduce that number and all of a sudden Ethiopia is at 30% and all the other ones are at 40%? What are the size of those economies then? And the reason access to electricity is an important measure of the size of the economy very quickly, just very simply, is because access to electricity talks about, you can't run a factory without access to electricity. You can't run a bakery without access to electricity. You can't run an audit firm without access to electricity. So access to electricity actually should tell you that it's a fundamental input into the growth of, a, of, a, of, a, of an economy. So that's the first thing I want you to make a note about, is that the upside opportunity of Africa is huge. Now, I want to just take a step back, comrades, and remind you that I said to you, I will share the how, but before I share the how, it's really important that you understand the macros. The macros are important, guys. If you're watching this and going, yo, what are we talking about? I promise you now, even your business that sells hand sanitizers, it, this stuff affects you because the big picture is, is something that affects all of us. You know, big picture is one of those things that doesn't matter until it matters, right? It's like regulation. You, you think it doesn't affect you, but actually it does. It really just does. So what I've done is I've taken four economies in the continent. I've given you what their GDP per capita is. Now, for those of you who didn't study economics, GDP per capita takes the GDP, which is the sum total of economic activity in an economy, and it um, divides it by the population. So it basically says, if your GDP is X divided by the population, then your GDP per person in the country is X. And the idea is that if your GDP per capita grows, then by definition, every person in the country is getting progressively wealthier. And so one of the things you might want to do is to go and look at South Africa's GDP per capita over the past 10 years. And you'll notice that South Africa's GDP per capita over the past 10 years has remained flat. And the minute you had actually adjusted for inflation, it's declined. So over the past 10 years, you have become progressively poorer as an average South African is the point. I've taken four economies in Africa. I compare them with four economies in Europe and I show you the GDP per capita, okay? And you'll notice that the GDP per capita are similar, but the population numbers are different. So the first economy I want to show you is Egypt. 96 million people in Egypt, right? 3,500 is the GDP per capita in dollars, but only 32% 30, of the population of Egypt is in the middle class with 99% access to electricity. Now look at that GDP per capita number. If you went to Europe, that number would mirror more a Armenia. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Armenia is the uh, home country of the Kardashians, right? 2.9 million people living in Armenia, but the GDP per capita is higher than the GDP per capita of Egypt. So that gives you a sense. What do you think would happen if, G if Egypt had a, a, a bigger middle class? And there's 32 million people in the middle class, 
Egypt all of a sudden had 40 or 55 million people in the middle class. What happens to the GDP per capita? Massive rise. So the upside for Egypt is huge. Massive upside. Okay. Let's take another economy. Let's come home. South Africa, 55 million people. 19.8% is the size of our middle class. These numbers are according to stats SA. 90% of us have access to electricity. There, they're about, it's about 80 something percent actually. And GDP per capita is at 5,273, right? Now, if you fast forward that and compare it to a Serbia, which has 7 million people, same GDP per capita. So what do you think happens if South Africa takes its middle class from 20% to 30%? What happens to that GDP per capita? All of you here building businesses are building businesses to sell products or services into an economy where people demand and buy them. Who demands and buys products and services? People living in an economy that's growing, that, that are earning real incomes and real wages that they can spend on those products and services. So the growth of GDP is actually a fundamental measure for you and I both as business people. Then look at Morocco, right? 25 million people. 27% middle class, 99% access to electricity, but look at that GDP per capita, 2,800. Who could you compare that with in Europe? You probably compare it with a country like Ukraine, similar type of number, right? I wanna do one last one, Ethiopia, 90 million people, one of my favorite countries in the world. Look at how low the Ethiopian GDP per capita is, guys. It's less than $1,000. Size of the middle class is at 88.2%. And what's that mean? It means you could compare it to a country like Nepal, Right. So the point I'm making here is that there is massive economic upside, massive economic upside for you and I as entrepreneurs and business builders building businesses every day. Massive, huge economic upside. So, Bazalwan, what must you do? Right. So I've made the macro point. Having made the macro point, I've shown you the stats. Having shown you the stats, I ask a simple question. If you're building a business today, what are the series of things that you need to do to make sure that you are relevant in the market today, that you are competitive? Um, so, 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 so I think let's just take a step back. So one of the things I think, guys, that's changed, and you can't get away from the fact that it's changed, is consumer behavior in the markets that we're operating in has changed, fundamentally changed, right? And I think a lot of us, what a lot of us are doing now is we're spending our time trying to retrofit reality into our plans rather than fit our plans into reality. I'm going to say it again. You're spending your time trying to retrofit reality into your plans rather than fit your plans into reality, right? And uh, there's huge risks when you do that. One of them is that if you surf against the winds of change, you will lose. That's the way it works. The winds of change break the surf in a particular direction. What you rather want to do is to pick up the winds of surf and surf in that direction. So you have to understand that the, the environment in which you are operating in is changing, has changed, and will continue to change for a very, very long period of time. Um, so anyway, so so... The point is that the market in it that we're operating in is fundamentally shifted and changed. And that's a great thing because it means that consumers who are acting in a particular way based on the world that was are now going to change the way that they are acting, right? Consumers are looking for new opportunities, new platforms, new service providers. It, it, the, the change is good. What remains for you, though, is how are you going to frame the value proposition of your business so that you can capitalize on that change and so that you can really make good on what that change means for you and your business. Now, I want to share something with you, which I, uh, I think will, will help you understand this concept a bit better. Have a look at this. Right. So, so you ought to ask yourself the question, how are you going to build a business that is consumer centric, customer centric, uh, you know, Excuse me, whatever you, however you want to think about it, but at the end of the day, you have to build a business that centers around the underlying user of your product, right? Um, how do you do that? Well, there are four things you have to do, and uh, make a note of these if you can. You've got to do these four things. But the first thing is you've got to make sure that the product that you're offering your market is relevant. For it to be relevant, it must be personalized and meaningful. Please underline the word personalized and meaningful. Right? I just want to pause here for a minute, Bazalwan. 
Mm. The word personalized means you must understand the person that is the customer. And if you're in a B2B business, the word personalized means you must understand the person that is the buyer of your product within the company that you're selling your product into. Personalized. Now, I wonder how many of you here have done an ethnographic, right? Um, or what we call an anthropological study of your customers. How many of you here? How many of you here have done any research about the, the, the anthropology of your customers? So if you don't understand the underlying drivers of your customers, why they are the way they are, why they think the way they think, what their aspirations are, where you hope to frame a value proposition for those customers, you can't, it's impossible. So take some time and understand the underlying person that is the customer. And once you've done that, you then have to frame the product that you're selling or the service that you're selling in a manner that for them is meaningful. Notice no one here said anything about money. It's meaningful. How, how do you know something is meaningful? It's meaningful when it has a material impact in the life of your customer, a material impact. Second, make sure what you offer that your customer is convenient. To do that, you've got to offer them three things. Choice, consistency, timeliness. Choice. Make sure that they have enough choice, timeliness. Give it to them as and when they need it, but most importantly, consistency. Guys, when it comes to being centered around your customer, being inconsistently good is worse than being consistently bad. I'll say that again. Being inconsistently good is worse than being consistently bad. And the reason that is is because when you are consistently bad, the customers know to expect that from you. It's a bit like the reason why nobody complains about the service at a home affairs, right? You didn't go to home affairs expecting great service. But if you go to a place where you get great service and then the next day it's bad service and then it's great service, then it's bad service, then it's great service, then it's bad service. What happens is you start adjudicating how bad the service is versus based on how great their service has been before, right? So what you really wanna do for your customers is make sure that you're consistently showing up. Consistency is the ultimate test. Third, be reliable. Now imagine that all of you here in your own businesses make some sort of promise to customers. Now, I often see them when I'm going through the underlying um, investment theses, stuff like, uh, um, you know, we deliver on time or, you know, 24 hour turnaround or best customer service, or you know, best value money can buy. If you make that kind of commitment to your customer, you better make sure that you deliver that commitment. So the brand promise of your business is fundamental, absolutely fundamental. Um, ShopRite says lowest prices every day. So many years ago when I was writing my, my first book, the, the Magna Carta of, of Exponentiality, I asked Whitey Besson, I said, are you really the, the lowest prices every day? He said, yes, lowest price KVIs. What does that mean? It means that of the known value items that Mr. and Mrs. Housewives know the price of, sugar, milli meal, baked beans, et cetera, sugar, milli meal, baked beans, bread, milk. Um, ShopRite wants to be the best priced every day, but ShopRite keeps over 17,000 SKUs. So they say lowest prices every day. What they mean is lowest prices on KVIs every day but out of an SKU of 17,000, only 40 of them do they want to win the price war. Does that make sense? So the point I'm making here, guys, is make sure that if you have a brand promise to your customers, you keep it. And finally, you have to be responsive. Be responsive, be responsive, be responsive, be responsive. What does this mean, this be responsive? It means you have to listen with the intent to understand so that you can act. Do not listen with the intent to respond. Too many of you are listening to your customers with the intent to respond. You're listening, you're asking for customer feedback so that you can respond, right? And as you're responding, you want to protect yourself and defend yourself. That's not what you want to do. What you want to do is to listen with the intent to understand, right? To listen with the intent to understand. Because once you listen with the intent to understand, the conversation with the customer fundamentally changes. Once you listen with the intent to understand, the conversation with the customer fundamentally changes, right? 
So, so, so the point I've made here is quite simply, question yourself about why you do what you do and question yourself about what it is ultimately that you're trying to achieve when you're doing the things that you're doing, right? Why are you listening to your customers? What is the actual thing that you're trying to achieve here? Okay. I wonder if you can uh, see my current screen. Um, you can. There you go. Let me share it with you. So how have markets, I told you earlier that customers have changed. In the olden days, we used to think about and talk about our customers in the demographic sense. Male, female, youth, pensioner, black, white, educated, not, wealthy, poor, employed, unemployed. There was like this very grayscale way we could think about our customers. We could put them in a little spreadsheet of things, plug their numbers and go, These customers, my ideal customer is a black female between the ages of 18 and 35 who is in her second job, earns 40,000 Rand a month and drives a Polo GTI. But I don't think a black female between that age would drive a Polo. That was a joke. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the point again that I'm making here quite simply is we used to have this very demographic way of looking at our customers. The way you've got to start thinking about your customers now, guys, you've got to start thinking about your customers as psychographic. And the reason this is, is because all of your customers are on the Internet every day consuming new information from new people. They're looking for new insights and they're using those new insights to act in new ways. So for most of you here. Your customers actually are comparing you to somebody in a different part of the world, the part of the world that they've never been to themselves. And so when you're talking about how do I pivot my business towards a digital era post-COVID, one of the things you've got to realize is that your competitors are not just the people in your country, in your location. You know, when I was growing up, when I was growing up in business, I could tell you who my competitor was based on their location. They had to be in a certain place doing a certain job for a certain type of customer and charging a certain price. That was my customer. That was my competitor. Now that's not the case anymore. My competitor can be anybody from anywhere. I'm competing right now with people I've never met and they're competing with me because we've flattened the world using this, this uh, very interesting construct called psychographics. Then the final thing I wanna share with you and after this, I wanna see, we can take some questions. Because for me, the, it's the exchange that's really important. Final thing I want you to realize is that even the way your customers understand value is changing. What does that mean? First, what is value? Value is the series of things we use to assimilate what matters and what's important. Value. The first way value is changing in the world today is this idea of identity. What does that mean? A clicks must fall can only happen in, a, in an environment where people feel that their identity is either being impugned or their image is being denigrated. I don't think that when that campaign by clicks was on, on Twitter, um, or was it Facebook? I'm not, I don't think that it was the intention of the company to be malicious. But that notwithstanding, their campaign didn't land well. And the reason is because what they missed to do was to read the cues of change around identity. And one of the things we're learning about identity is that all previously marginalized groups are now seeking to stand out. So what are the previously marginalized groups? It's people of color, black people, predominantly, but not exclusively. People of color, females, the disabled, and then people in the LGBTQI plus community. Those previously marginalized groups are all saying to the world, we want to be seen for who we are, not for who you want us to be, right? So identity is changing. Second, the way your customers think about wealth is changing. Pre-COVID, wealth was how much money do I have in the bank? Now, wealth is how much time, how many relationships, how many connections, right? Um, that's what's been proving more important to people now. Third, legacy. 
the way your customers are fundamentally thinking about what it's all for is also changed. I think pre-COVID legacy, if you were a B2B business, was about growth and balance sheet, growth and revenues. If you were B2C business, it was definitely about growth and market share. Now, I think it's shifted. I think it's more about meaningful impact, making a difference in community, and having high impact for the customers you work with every day. Fourth, this archetype of masculinity, be careful for this, especially those of you who use social media to market your business. Be very, very careful of this. This is people to walk into. So we, we come from a world of gender binaries, right? Male, female. And one of the things that's happened is there's now been a blend of gender, right? And that blending in the middle is a massive crevice for you to walk into if you're not careful this archetype of masculinity, that what we have tended to do was to have very masculine conversations with our customers, very domineering conversations with our customers. And we use very masculine domineering words, words like best, highest, most. But we're learning too that actually more tempered language is, is an even better way to start communicating with your customers, right? A more tempered, a more human language is a, more temp is, a, is a better way. And then finally, it's this idea of free. Now, I don't know how many of you in this conversation offer anything for free to your customers. If you don't, you're definitely missing a trick. Free is a fundamental part of how you build, man, especially how you build for the future. Like, it's a huge part of how you build. And the reason you want to offer for free is because you want people to get used to a taste of what you're offering. So, for instance, if your business is in catering and you supply uh, healthy meals to the busy executive and you want to compete with you cook and um, uh, chef something, the other one, um, forget their names now, and Nyapi chef and the rest of them, how do you propose to do that in the world we're in today? I'm going to suggest to you that one of the things you want to do is to identify a target customer and to offer them a product for free. So you're offering, you know, highly nutritious, uh, highly nutritious, high value, low cost meals to the busy executive who doesn't have time to cook. Right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for Sam Apata because I know Sam is that kind of person. I'm going to offer him a week's consignment of goods for free. Hi, Sam, here's food for a week, one meal every day. If you like it, you can start buying from me. That is a more effective way to get Sam to buy from you than to take the same amount of money and run a Facebook campaign and hope that Sam is going to look at an image of your food, great, a well-taken picture by a fairly decent photographer and buy from you. Because a great, a well-taken picture from a fairly decent photographer with a decent landing page is just not enough anymore. You've got to move now towards experiential ways of selling to your customers. And so I'm suggesting to you that one of the things you want to do is to start thinking about how can you offer what you're offering to your customers for free. But also give yourself time to date your customers. I think a lot of us here don't spend time going on dates with our customers. How many of you here are actively dating your customer? You know, the, the process of dating is a great process, very romantic, right? Seth Gordon talks about this more eloquently than I can. So have a quick look at this video. What a chance of a lifetime. What an opportunity to reinvent, to make a difference. So how do you do that? First idea is this. There are two ways to get married, right? The first way to get married is to go on Tinder and swipe right over and over and over again, proposing marriage to every single person you swipe. This is a stupid way to get married. The other way to get married is to go on a date. If it goes well, go on another date with that person. Then on the third date, you meet their parents, they meet your parents, you get engaged, right? You wait till the seventh date before you tell them you're out on parole. 
This method of dating, it worked for me. Maybe it worked for you. It's a smart way to get married. So why aren't you dating your prospects? Permission marketing is this idea of connecting to people who want to be connected to, marketing to people who want to be marketed to, delivering anticipated personal and relevant messages to people who want to get them. Delivering anticipated, relevant, and personal messages to people who want to get them. Date your customers, right? Date your customers. And the thing about dating your customers is you've got to be allow yourself to be patient, don't rush it, learn the customer, be enthused by the customer. That's a very important part. Like genuinely fall in love with your customer, be enthused by the customer. It's a very important part of this whole conversation about dating your customer, right? Very important part. And then the last thing I want to share with you is you go, you're going to have to learn to unlearn. You have to learn to unlearn. Um, I think there are a lot of you in this conversation who know the world the way it was and have learned to work in the world the way you know it to be. But you are going to have to learn to unlearn. Unlearn the way you know things to be. Unlearn the way you do things. Unlearn the way you're thinking about things. Unlearn the way you are interacting with your market, your customers, your competitors. You are going to have to unlearn because if you can't unlearn, you will not find the upside in growth. So I want you to ask yourself this question. And here's the question. Just make a note of it for yourself if you can in your notepad. The question is this. What are the things that I know to be true that are no longer true? <laughs> Sounds very cryptic, right? It's a very powerful question. What are the things that I know to be true that are no longer true? I'm going to give you a good example. Things that I know to be true that are no longer true is that unemployed black women living in townships above the age of 35 don't really worry about the quality of a product when they're buying it. They worry more about the quantity of their product when they're buying it. Remember when we were told they would buy more of a particular soap than a different soap because that soap came with more quantity. We know today that that's not true, that actually customers who are most obsessed, the customers most obsessed with quality are the customers with the least amount of disposable income. The customers most obsessed with quality are the customers with the least amount of disposable income. And if you think about it, it actually makes sense because for those customers, they have the least amount of money to waste. Every, every rand that they spend has to go the farthest, right? Every rand that they spend has to travel the longest distance. It has to keep them in, in play and in business for the longest amount of time, right? Has to keep them in play for the longest amount of time. So I'm almost done, but I did want to share this with you now. Let's end very quickly by just talking about why we've been disrupted by the period that we're in. We've been disrupted because three things have happened. You can only disrupt in, in an environment where there are three things that happen. There has to be free sharing, there has to be voluntary collaboration, and there has to be a, an environment of trust. And one of the things lockdown did and COVID did is it forced us into a space where we had to share information with each other. We had to collaborate with each other. Otherwise, you couldn't work because you couldn't go anywhere. And by inference, it meant you had to trust the person on the other side of the Zoom call, the Teams meeting. You just had to trust the other person. And so I'm suggesting to you that these three things are going to continue to be relevant in our lives and in our businesses. The question for you and I is what are we going to do about it, right? And whether or not you and I will continue to understand the importance of those three things. So ask yourself if you're leveraging sharing collaboration and trust as you build your business. The next thing to ask yourself, anytime you're looking at information, guys, anytime you're dealing with news, is to ask yourself the question, is this hindsight, is it insight, or is it foresight? See, hindsight is what we know happened. Insight is what does it mean? Foresight is what does it tell me? What should I do? And I'm going to suggest to you that too many of you are spending your time in hindsight conversations and in insight meetings. Hindsight conversations. Ushiri ran away. 
Zuma doesn't want to testify at the Zondo Commission. Uh, <laughs> I could keep going, right? Anytime you hear the media say breaking news, that's hindsight. They're telling you what happened. Insight is how many customers are buying? What are they buying? When are they buying it? It's months time. What will my customers buy? What will they want? How will they want it? How do I ready myself now for what's going to happen in six months time? Foresight. So constantly question what you are seeing. Don't take it for granted. And then finally, and then I'm done, done. You have to learn that you, you must seek to be disappointed by your heroes. All of us in this conversation have heroes. These are people that we look up to who have done amazing and incredible things and they're heroes of ours but they're going to disappoint us. And the reason heroes disappoint us, one is because they're human and two, because they were heroes in a particular context. To prove the point, have a quick look at this video. People who've been in the rocketry business for decades, yeah. who say about you that you don't know what you don't know. Well, I, I suppose that's true of anyone. <laughs> How can anyone know what they don't know? <laughs> but when uh, critics say you can't do this, your answer to them is we've done it. He's done it in partnership with NASA, which has given SpaceX technical advice and a contract worth up to $1.6 billion, mostly for 12 cargo flights to the space station. But SpaceX's lack of experience bothers some NASA legends like Apollo astronauts Neil Armstrong and Gene Cernan. They've testified to Congress that the Obama administration's drive to commercialize space could compromise safety and eventually cost the taxpayers. Now is the time to overrule this administration's pledge to mediocrity. You know, there are American heroes who don't like this idea. Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial space flight in the way that you're developing it. And I wonder what you think of that. I was very sad to see that uh, because those guys are, yeah. You know, those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. You know, I, I wish they would come and visit and, and see the hardware that we're doing here. And, and I think that would change their mind. They inspired you to do this, didn't they? Yes. And to see them casting stones in your direction. It's difficult. Did you expect them to cheer you on? So they're hoping they would. So, you just watched Elon Musk, the world's Iron Man, a little boy who grows up in <laughs> Pretoria, leaves South Africa for the United States, arrives in the US, starts a couple of startups, uh, is in varsity, drops out of varsity, starts a couple of startups with marginal success. Then he and a friend of his called Max Levchin came up with a what's called a Web 2.0 HTML driven payment platform that they built called x.com. They built this incredible business called x.com and across the road in Palo Alto, there are a couple of other guys, Reed Hoffman and a couple of other guys, um, Mark Andreessen, who are building another business called PayPal. And they decide that they're going to merge x.com and PayPal, but that the name PayPal actually sounds better. So they merge x.com with PayPal, becomes one entity and Elon Musk becomes the CEO and Max is COO. They build PayPal and they sell it for billions of dollars. Then Elon Musk um, decides that he's not done. You know, I mean, by the way, guys, when you make that kind of money, you know, it's the kind of money that most of us in this room, myself included, would be like, as in St. Quentin, the lunch, I'm going to the beach. He decides that he's not done. He wants to do more. And so more he does. He buys into a couple of other startups, one or two of them fail, but he also buys into like this very strange electric car business called Tesla, which at the time had one product, the Tesla Roadster. You know, today we talk about the wonder that is Tesla, the massive growth in market valuation. But actually, we forget that when Elon Musk bought into Tesla, the two founders had one car. It was a Roadster. It wasn't a particularly great looking car, right? And the technology wasn't what it is today. So we often adjudicate the success of, of Tesla today and say, of course, he succeeded, but we forget the time he bought into it at. 
Years later, he gets into space with SpaceX, making space travel more affordable, the video you just watched now. Then the Hyperloop, then Neuralink. The list goes on and on and on. But you just watch that man have his own heroes tear him apart on national TV. And so I'm saying this to make this point, that if you really want to push the boundaries of what's possible and take your business to the next frontier, you can only do it if you're willing to be disappointed by your heroes. Don't take for granted that the people who've done things that you find remarkable are going to be remarkable forever. Everybody reaches a plateau. And those people get to a point where they themselves stop growing and stop developing and stop morphing and changing. And sometimes you grow past them. I've had that happen in my life so many times where I grow past a person who used to be a hero of mine. And I've had to learn that it's okay to grow past your heroes.